Amid the war between Israel and Hamas, a new Vox News article makes the case that Israel, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has failed the country and that we can be sure that his policy of repressing Palestinians does not make Israelis safer. Senior correspondent at Vox, Zach Beecham, joins us now to discuss. Thanks for being with us, Zach. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for talking about the article. It's a pretty rough story to be covering right now. I've got family there, lots of people I know in the area, and it's just... Uh, it sucks. It's pretty yes. awful. It's pretty yeah, awful. it's absolutely awful. Um, I, I read your article. I thought it was uh, terrific going over some of the history here. You know, for, for viewers, uh, and including myself, who wasn't very familiar with this uh, until now, walk us through some of the ways that Netanyahu's uh, uh, government kind of credibly deserves blame for actually the rise of Hamas or the extent of Hamas's power in the region. Sure. So it's worth going back to the Hamas takeover of the Gaza Strip in 2007. Um, that was before Netanyahu was prime minister for his very, very long stretch between 2009 and 2021. During that time, Israel set up a blockade that was designed to prevent Hamas from um, from, from uh, basically staying and establishing its power in the way that it ultimately did. It became clear relatively quickly that this policy wasn't undermining Hamas's uh, base of support in Gaza. Uh, it's actually, if anything, was entrenching it and that it was now in control of black markets as opposed to, you know, actually getting to uh, having, having to face a serious economic situation, uh, open trade, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, they kept it on. And why did they keep it on is the very interesting question. Right. And this is primarily a Netanyahu choice. And it seems this has sort of been an open secret among a lot of Israelis. Uh, and some Netanyahu said it openly, reportedly at one point, that he believed the Palestinians needed to stay divided to prevent a credible two state solution from emerging. Uh, and in order to do that, that means tacitly propping up Hamas in the Gaza Strip to ensure that there's not a reconciliation with the West Bank, which is governed by the more moderate Fatah faction. Uh, so that's one way, I think, sort of in the big picture, it seems that the Israeli rights gamble, which is that preventing the emergence of a credible two-state solution is more important than, uh, you know, dealing with the terrorist threat on our border, significantly endangered Israelis and contributed to a climate where events like uh, October 7th were possible. And what's notable is how that view is extremely controversial, I think, uh, on this side of the Atlantic. But in a uh, major newspaper, Haaretz, in Israel last week, the editorial board wrote an op-ed that basically said that. They said, quote, the disaster that befell Israel on the holiday of Simchat Torah is the clear responsibility of one person, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister who has prided himself on his vast political experience and irreplaceable wisdom in security matters, completely failed to identify the dangers he was consciously leading Israel into when establishing a government of annexation and dispossession. Can you speak at all to what people in Israel are saying, I know that there was a recent poll that suggested that the majority of the public does blame Benjamin Netanyahu for various reasons, whether it's security reasons or because of kind of maintaining the conditions in Gaza that boiled over in this horrifically tragic way. Are you able to give us any clarity there about what's been going on on the intervening week back in Israel? Sure. Uh, Israelis are furious. And that poll, uh, it's not just a majority in the poll that you were citing. It's about 80 percent mm -hmm. of Israelis current government. And Israelis don't agree on anything. It's a famously, famously fractious political situation that had been deadlocked for years now. And so for that level of unanimity to emerge that the government is at fault is truly striking. Uh, polling for the next election, which is not to be held for a little bit, but could happen in Israel's rickety political system at any time, uh, shows that if they were held tomorrow, the current government would lose its majority by a pretty substantial margin mm. uh, to the centrist opposition. Uh, and you've also seen a wave of Israelis publicly screening at, governor, uh, at governing officials, right? So the government sends somebody to a hospital to deal with people who are suffering injuries in the, after Hamas's terrorist attack. Uh, and you, or, or you see, you know, somebody showing up at a funeral from the, on behalf of the government. And there's, there's footage of Israelis screaming at them, blaming them. Uh, for their policies directly contributing to this attack, right? It's not just mainstream opinion that Netanyahu is responsible in Israel. It's the, the vast majority of Israelis see the government as deserving blame, believe that their government failed them. So, I, I mean, I don't know of any credible security analysts who say that the government security policies, there's a variety of different ways in which they contributed. For example, deploying 
too many troops to the West Bank to do with provocations their own government had caused, created vulnerabilities that Hamas exploited. And that's just, it's, it's, it's the clear, clear consensus view in Israel right now. So just to clarify, when you're talking about uh, the reallocation of resources to the West Bank, is that uh, the coverage I've been seeing about the choice to send kind of troops to protect settlers uh, as opposed to keeping them in near the Gaza Strip? And that's that created this vulnerability? Yeah. So the, the current government, Netanyahu's coalition prior to the war, was an extreme right government. Um, and it included a number of different ministers whose aim was to promote annexation of the West Bank, de facto, basically, uh, control over it, right? And so in service of that project, uh, settlers who often commit extremist violence on their own felt emboldened, right, or were actively encouraged by the government. So the government worked to try to solidify legal mechanisms of control in the West Bank and also uh, tr basically turned a blind eye to fairly significant escalations by settlers, not only in the West Bank, but also in Jerusalem. But for simplicity's sake, we can focus on the West Bank because those provocations created a really tense environment that required Israel to deploy more troops over to the West Bank. And it seems that that came at the expense of deployments on the Gaza border. Um, so again, you can see it here is a direct one-to-one -one line, right? There were unmanned posts at mm -hmm. the Gaza border. There were not rapid response teams in place that were needed in order to deal with the Hamas incursion. Setting aside whatever your critique of the overall Israeli security policy is, whatever it is, right? Whatever your view on it is, it is very clear that in this concrete way, the government's policies in the West Bank contributed to the conditions that that made the attack possible. Mm. Zach Beecham, thank you so much for joining us today. And of course, you know, best wishes, thoughts with you for any friends and family you have in the region. Thanks a lot.